has been a time for gathering the longhouse and sharing information around the fire. This is our contribution to that tradition. So, uh, dogs like Takani here, uh, my Siberian Husky pup, are kind of uh, uniquely outfitted for handling cold weather. And uh, she's got this double layer of fur to help her ward off the, the cold and, uh, and any kind of precipitation as well. Even uh, some fur in between the pads of her feet. Um, we humans don't have uh, all that going for us. Uh, we're kind of fragile in that, in that sense. We got the uh, extra brain cells and the uh, opposable thumbs, and, but we gave up the ability to handle extremes of weather as well as a dog like Takani can. Um, so uh, my name's Ken. Uh, talking to you today from Shenandoah National Park out in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's Veterans Day, so uh, big shout out to uh, all my brothers and sisters in arms out there. And we're going to talk about uh, some cold weather injuries, illnesses, and uh, some high altitude illnesses as well. Uh, what things we can look for out there, ways to prevent it, uh, signs and symptoms, and ways that we can treat these ailments out in the field as best we can until we can get somebody to definitive care. So, uh, one of the first ailments we're going to talk about today, um, while we're hitting the wave tops of these, uh, different cold weather and high altitude illnesses and injuries, is uh, something we've probably all had uh, a time or two if we've, uh, if we've spent any time out in the uh, cold weather environment, either here in the East Coast or out west in the Rockies or out in the Cascades or wherever you might have gone in the world. And uh, that's chillblains. A lot of people uh, don't even realize uh, what it is when they've, uh, uh, you know, sustained some of that. Uh, but really, it's a it's a very uh, superficial thing, and it's uh, usually a self-limiting and self-healing thing. Um, basically, it's uh, no no real cell damage or uh, tissue damage to speak of. Uh, just some um, small, uh, tiny ulcers, almost uh, uh, that uh, are usually will appear uh, places like nose, uh, earlobes, uh, things of that nature, uh, sometimes fingers and toes um, in extreme cold uh, situations uh, if you've been exposed to cold, uh, cold temps and wind for a long time. Um, and really all it is is uh, uh, basically a, uh, your body's response to that, uh, that cold challenge um, and uh, wind and, and things like that and extreme cold uh, going across uh, your skin. Uh, basically causing some redness and uh, some minor uh, uh, tiny little uh, ulcers uh, that um, are painful, um, absolutely painful. Um, but, uh, like I said, uh, most of the time uh, those things are self-healing unless uh, they've been burst open somehow uh, and uh, you, uh, you end up uh, getting a, a local infection uh, due to the, the chill blinds. Um, another type that goes right along with that that uh, um, can happen uh, and probably many of us have had uh, uh, the, the bare minimum of this is frost nip. Uh, again, no tissue damage there. It's very superficial. It's going to be painful. Um, if you've ever spent any time as a kid out there playing uh, all day in a, on a snow day uh, and you've had that wind and cold going by you all day and you came in and your uh, nose and cheeks and maybe your ears were plenty red and uh, rosy-cheeked and uh, wind burnt, um, that's, a, that's definitely uh, uh, the starts of, uh, of frost nip. Uh, again, superficial, uh, no real cellular damage there. Um, and uh, a lot of that has to do with how our bodies lose heat. Um, we uh, you know, can lose our heat from our bodies uh, th through four big ways out there. Uh, so we've got radiation, which is uh, your body radiating heat away from it at any given time. Um, any exposed skin, especially around the head and neck region, uh, is a quick, sure way to lose heat out of your body and uh, radiating uh, that heat away from your body. Um, another way is conduction. Um, if you sat on that cold rock uh, in the wintertime sometime out there or sat right on the snow or ice or something like that for a while, um, absolutely uh, uh, 
perfect way to conduct that heat out of your body into that cold surface. It's just going to suck the heat right out of your body. Um, convection uh, is the wind coming across your body. Uh, the third way, convection. Um, wind or air uh, moving across your body, or maybe you're moving and causing that convection, uh, i.e. Uh, skiing or, or something of that nature uh, moving along. Um, and then finally, uh, evaporation, uh, which um, happens uh, with respiration. Every time we uh, exhale, uh, we're losing a lot of water vapor out of our bodies. And uh, even things like perspiration uh, that falls under that same category uh, as we sweat, um, another way to uh, lose heat out of your body. Uh, which kind of brings up the old uh, adage that, you know, uh, uh, you, if you're moving around in wintertime, uh, your level of exertion is a direct contributor uh, to helping you get uh, a heat injury or a cold injury. Uh, that heat escaping your body, um, you're, you're moving, moving fast, and uh, maybe you're sweating through uh, your layers of clothing. Uh, you know what? You want to kind of pick a pace that you can sustain for a few, a couple, three hours out there and, uh, and not end up uh, sweating through your layers. Uh, if you're losing water out of your body, you're definitely setting yourself up for, uh, for failure uh, with regard to getting a, a, you know, a, a cold injury of some kind. Um, now, uh, there's kind of a balancing act going on there uh, with um, certainly you want to be able to move around. That's going to help you uh, fight that cold challenge. You're, you're generating some of your own heat that way. But you got to find that right uh, perfect uh, uh, level to go at so that, yes, you are generating heat for your body, but no, you're not sweating through your layers and, uh, and causing trouble there. Um, and that also brings up one of the ways that we can prevent cold injuries out there, aside from uh, monitoring our level of exertion and uh, keeping our hydration levels up, uh, including electrolytes, things of that nature, uh, but also um, how we dress out there. Uh, we've all heard about the layering principle by this point, and uh, I'm sure that in uh, one of Evan's other uh, Longhouse uh, series videos, uh, uh, he's discussed uh, clothing systems and uh, sleep systems. Um, but uh, along those lines, remember uh, one of the, uh, the old sayings there is, uh, is cotton kills. Um, cotton is definitely a, a, a bad way to go in the dead of winter. Um, if it gets wet, it loses much of its insulative uh, ability, um, and uh, it's going to stay wet, and you're not going to get warm in that stuff out there. Um, if, if, you can, if you end up getting uh, uh, wet somehow, uh, due to precipitation or maybe you sweated through your layers, those kinds of things. So keep that in mind out there. You want to kind of err on the side of the uh, synthetics out there and uh, things that are meant for the winter environment, then uh, I think you'd be much better off in that regard. Um, there's another acronym out there, too, that uh, kind of helps with uh, how to uh, prevent a lot of these cold weather injuries out there, and uh, that's the cold acronym. Uh, C stands for keep it clean, and that means you and your clothing system uh, your body does better when it's clean out there in that cold weather environment. Uh, uh, I, I, trust me when I tell you that layer of mud is not going to help you stay warmer. Um, might create a barrier of some kind, but uh, but that's about it. Um, o stands for avoid overheating, um, and we just kind of discussed that with not uh, busting out that bead of sweat uh, in that cold weather environment. It's it's not always realistic. Sometimes we do end up uh, perspirating a little bit. Uh, while we're moving, uh, doing whatever tasks we're doing out there in the hills and mountains. But uh, hey, we're going to try and monitor that and regulate that as best we can. Uh, L stands for dressing in lo loose layers. Um, like I said, uh, we've, we've already discussed a great deal of the layering principle and other things. And heck, it's everywhere you turn anymore uh, with, with regard to how to dress in the winter environment. It's a pretty widely known subject nowadays. Um, and then D, keep it dry. Uh, so C-O-L-D, uh, keep it dry. Uh, obviously, stay dry, stay warm. Stay dry, stay healthy, uh, particularly in that winter environment. Cold, wet environment here of the East Coast or even out in the Rockies where it is drier, but uh, if you start perspiring, things of that nature, it's going to cause detriment to your, uh, your clothing system and your body. Um, so keep that in mind. Other ways uh, that we can prevent some of the problems out there um, are a couple of little tricks um, aside from the food and, and fluids that you put in your body, warm food and fluids, uh, keeping those uh, glucose levels up in your muscles and things of that nature. Um, 
and your clothing system, um, regulating your, your exertion level, things of that nature. Um, but uh, there's a couple other little tricks out there that uh, really help. Uh, one is uh, this stuff, uh, Dermatone uh, Skin Protector, uh, SPF 23, clinically proven to retard frostbite. Um, so not only will it protect you from the sun, uh, but uh, this stuff is great for um, helping uh, ward off uh, uh, you know, frost nip and frostbite. Um, so I uh, highly recommend getting this stuff. It's uh, available online. Um, basically a petrolatum based uh, sub substance um, so it could even be used as an emergency uh, uh, fire starter if you needed to um, but uh, um, you put a put this on your nose cheeks lips earlobes things of that nature any exposed skin really um, any of that convective heat loss of, uh, of uh, wind whipping across your body uh, that cold air out there this creates a really nice ba uh, barrier of it it's a uh, it's not water-based. There's no water in it, so it will not flash freeze. Um, years ago, uh, I was uh, involved in some uh, winter warfare training up in uh, Quebec, uh, Valcartier, uh, that area, and uh, a week where it was never above minus 35 Fahrenheit, and uh, we were living in snow caves doing uh, 20K ski movements, uh, pulling uh, Akios uh, out there. And uh, my team um, and uh, one other team, we both went out of pocket and bought this for our teams as, uh, as team medics. And we were the only two teams that didn't get uh, frostbit out there in that, that weather. Uh, so highly recommend this stuff, folks. Um, one of the other little tricks, if you will, out there, and it really does work, is uh, maybe sp uh, sprinkling a little bit of cayenne pepper or chili powder into your socks. Um, now, I'll advise you straight away to uh, not... Uh, go overboard with that stuff, uh, maybe just a little, uh, more necessarily isn't better, um, and ensure you don't get any of that stuff on your fingers. Uh, you get one speck of that in your eyes and you'll know it quickly. However, in a very cold environment, if you're prone to cold feet, um, a little bit of cayenne pepper in your socks um, will uh, stimulate superficial capillary blood flow and uh, your feet will feel warmer. It really does work. Um, that being said, once you got back into um, uh, a warm environment, back to the tent for the night or something like that, um, you definitely want to get that stuff off your feet uh, uh, quick um, and rub them down with some uh, you know, cornstarch powder or some kind of foot powder um, or potentially some kind of lotion um, after you've cleaned that stuff off your feet uh, because your feet might actually uh, start feeling too warm or even sting a little bit. Uh, some folks actually like to put uh, the cayenne pepper between a liner sock and their, uh, their outer thick sock, and that seems to work a little better for them for uh, not having that, uh, that stuff start stinging their feet uh, down the road. But it really does work, so it might be something to uh, take, a, take a try with it at some point if you, if you, if you like to. And heck, it's, uh, it's not that expensive to get in any grocery store. So moving on through uh, some of the other uh, levels of frostbite, uh, you know, superficial and, and then into deep frostbite, um, certainly, uh, any of these events that you might participate in with uh, Hill People Gear or even going out in the backcountry on your own, um, you know, before it ever gets to that, uh, that deep frostbite uh, severe level, you absolutely want to be getting down to uh, uh, some, some kind of definitive care facility and getting that uh, taken care of early on. Um, again, we're, we're staying on the wave tops with this stuff, so uh, not going to go too in-depth of what all happens with... Uh, uh, severe frostbite in a hospital setting. But um, out in the field, what are we looking for? Well, certainly, initially, um, that, uh, uh, that superficial layers of, of uh, frostbite uh, happening, uh, that uh, superficial frostbite, it's going to be painful, absolutely. Um, you may have experienced it just on the edge of that uh, with uh, frost nip. Um, and then uh, initially start off a little red, maybe. Um, and then later on, uh, uh, it's going to uh, be uh, still pliable skin at first. All right, it won't be uh, won't be all hard and, and waxy in appearance like you might have seen in some movies or uh, films of climbers in the Himalaya or anything like that. Um, it's going to initially be uh, still pliable skin, but extremely cold, um, and um, maybe getting on the edge of numbness. All right, um, now we're getting into some of that tissue being damaged in there, uh, ice crystals forming inside. Uh, the interstitial layers of, of your uh, of your skin uh, down down into the muscles and things of that nature. 
uh, the blood vessels are starting to constrict. They're, everything's constricting and everything's shunting towards your core. Your body's trying to uh, protect itself against uh, that cold challenge. Uh, so numbness. Um, later on, if it does progress into a more severe form, and uh, well and truly you should have already been on your way back down off that mountain and into a, a, a definitive care facility. Uh, but later on, that stuff might progress to more of a waxy appearance. And it's going to be hard. Uh, almost uh, like wooden, um, if you will. Um, and uh, again, numb, painless at this point, no pain. And uh, now um, we're in a real problem right now. And, and definitely that's, this is something you're going to have to seek uh, medical aid for uh, from uh, healthcare professionals uh, with regard to stopping uh, that tissue damage from progressing any further, slow rewarming, things of that nature. Um, and uh, with the... Uh, with how we can treat it out in the field, um, some myths that have been out there with regard to how do you handle frostbite out in the field. Definitely do not uh, rub vigorously with snow. Uh, I don't know where that came from, um, but it is definitely a myth. Um, and uh, don't soak them in ice water, uh, your hands or your feet. Um, that's another myth that's out there. Uh, again, still don't know where that came from either. Uh, Might have been. Uh, around the same time that people thought uh, putting leeches on people's skin was a, was a good thing to do. Um, neither one of those are acceptable uh, treatments for frostbite. Um, what you can do, slow rewarming, not rapid, okay, slow rewarming, and uh, definitely uh, uh, if it's hands or feet, maybe you want to wrap them in some kind of uh, uh, nice, dry, bulky, sterile dressings of some kind, and uh, you're going to keep those things um, uh, protected as best you can. Get those hands into mittens, not gloves, mittens. Um, get fresh socks on, things of that nature. And uh, if that person's got to walk out, um, you're probably not going to want to unfreeze uh, that those feet or those hands uh, if there's a chance that uh, that, the, that they could be refrozen in the environment. So um, once they have truly uh, frozen uh, themselves and, and they've got that frostbite going on, um, if you've got to walk them out, then... Uh, they're going to obviously need assistance. They're not going to be able to walk as well. So um, keep them frozen until you can get them to definitive care, and then there's going to be a whole process that you'll have to go through to, uh, to help that person uh, uh, recover from that, that injury. Um, if you can keep them warm, by all means, uh, go ahead and, and uh, do a slow re rewarming process in a warm environment, heated tent, back to a lodge, whatever it might be, and uh, slowly rewarm them. Don't uh, stick their hands in, uh, uh, you know, hot water or put them right next to a fire or something like that. Uh, it needs to be a slow process. There's going to be some pain involved as uh, feeling returns to those uh, those vessels and uh, to those uh, fingertips and toes. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, get that slow rewarming process going on and let them eventually thaw out. And, and uh, uh, you might even include some uh, some pain meds of some kind, Tylenol, aspirin, whatever the person will tolerate uh, to uh, to help them uh, uh, deal with that pain a little bit better. Obviously, warm fluids, food, uh, things of that nature. Uh, let that core rewarm and let that body do its job of uh, getting those vessels uh, replenished with uh, warm, oxygenated blood, again, out to the periphery, out to your fingers and toes. Um, and that's really about the best things you can do for, uh, for a frostbitten person out there in the field is, uh, hey, uh, you know, if, if, they've got to, if, they're, if they've got to be walked out, go ahead and keep... Uh, Keep those things frozen, unfortunately. Um, get them wrapped up. Uh, cover those things as best you can. Maybe you can uh, pull them out on a sled or something like that so they don't have to be walking on those frozen feet. Um, and uh, and then get them to that definitive care facility. And then they'll begin the rewarming process back there. And hope. So the next part of uh, what we're going to talk about out here is uh, uh, hypothermia, uh, the next level of cold injury out there. Um, Many of us probably have been hypothermic uh, to a degree or two over the years and maybe didn't even realize it. Uh, maybe we got away with it. Um, but if you stay in that cold weather environment and don't do anything about it, it can be a killer. So uh, keep that in mind when you're out and about uh, this winter and any winters uh, from here on is uh, taking notice of those things. Uh, look at yourself and uh, look at... Uh, your, your, uh, your partners uh, that are out there with you and keep an eye on each other. What do we look for uh, with hypothermia? Well, um, really, uh, our normal body core temperature is 98.6. Uh, 
anything below that, um, 95, uh, uh, down to around uh, 89 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, you're hypothermic, essentially. Um, of course, below 89, some say around the 90, 90 degree or 91 degree uh, Fahrenheit range, uh, you're getting into the more severe forms. But anything below 98.6 or 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit uh, down to around the, the high 80s or, uh, or low 90s, uh, you're mildly hypothermic then, mild to moderate hypothermia. Um, and uh, if left unchecked, uh, this can absolutely kill you. Um, what are we looking for with folks out there? A um, uh, good, good way to remember it is the umbles. Uh, you're looking for um, someone stumbling, mumbling, grumbling, and, and things of that nature, tumbling, uh, any of the umbles out there, um, uh, so that uh, um, basically they're, they're, they're not regulating uh, things in their body anymore. They're not regulating that heat and uh, helping themselves uh, generate heat against that cold challenge out there. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to bring my uh, assistant in uh, to kind of go over a, a couple of things to what we're looking for with uh, somebody uh, with hypothermia and how do we treat them. So I'll bring in my, uh, my daughter Delaney and uh, she's just going to have a seat right here. Uh, obviously uh, she's, uh, she's staying warm and up right now in her mountain serapi, um, but uh, um, we're going to run through uh, some possibilities of how we can treat a hypothermic person. Um, and I notice she's even doing a little bit of uh, what might uh, be considered uh, the beginnings of hypothermia, and that's uh, a little bit of shivering. Um, as you're, uh, you become hypothermic, uh, that shivering process is a, a good thing, okay? It's, um, it's your body, uh, your hypothalamus, uh, that controls all of the, uh, the heat regulation in your body. It's your body's radiator, if you will. Um, sends out uh, shivering and things of that, uh, that, like that to, uh, to help you generate uh, some muscular activity to uh, help rewarm yourself. So initially, shivering is a good thing. Um, over time, it, it can become uh, violent and uh, uncontrollable. Um, and so that violent, uh, uh, uncontrollable shivering is definitely a sure sign that somebody is, uh, is, is hypothermic. That, along with uh, things like uh, the umbles that I had uh, uh, mentioned earlier, they're stumbling, uh, they're maybe uh, somewhat incoherent, uh, not really caring what's going on around them, uh, not making good choices out on that trail. Um, stumbling around, maybe tripping and falling on things. Uh, so those are definitely uh, sure signs out there. What, what can we do right away to keep, to stay ahead of what I like to call the hypothermia curve? Absolutely, uh, it's common sense. Get some, uh, some warmth around that person. Extra layers, stopping, getting some, uh, some fluids, uh, some warm fluids and food into them if they'll accept that. that uh, as long as they're conscious, absolutely, that's, that's a good thing to do. Um, Getting those extra layers on the hands and feet, mittens, uh, new socks, uh, uh, maybe a, a warmer hat, maybe a hood, things of that nature uh, really uh, uh, help uh, fight that cold challenge to keep it for, from progressing into that more severe form. What else we can do is um, start thinking about um, maybe we can up their activity a little, level a little bit to get some warmth generated back in your body, uh, moving around uh, some moderate exercise without sweating uh, to uh, help you do that. You kind of got to balance that, uh, that level of exertion uh, piece again so that you don't get them sweating, but also um, you don't want to increase your ra uh, rate of ascent because uh, now you have to uh, balance that against um, potentially getting a, an altitude I injury, um, which we'll talk about in a little while. Is, is Hey, you know, we've got to balance all those things together um, so that uh, keep the person warm but not uh, overexert them, things of that nature. So anything to fight that cold challenge. Um, as that uh, uh, hypothermia uh, is allowed to become more severe, um, now the body starts uh, decompensating for things. Um, that violent shivering may only come in waves, um, a wave of shivering and then a cessation of shivering. Um, the body's vital signs start sh uh, slowing down quite a bit more. Um, the pulse is going to slow. The breathing is going to slow and get a little more shallow. Um, those are things we really need to worry about now. We, this is uh, on the verge of becoming a medical emergency at that point. Um, eventually, that, that shivering is going to cease altogether. Uh, 
the person is going to have uh, start getting an altered level of consciousness to the point of almost unconscious. Uh, uh, that you may see things like uh, some some paradoxical things like uh, um, they they may start undressing even though they're they're extremely cold uh, but they may start undressing it's a paradoxical behavior uh, rather bizarre um, they may also start trying to burrow this is a kind of a thing where the you know I guess back to our mammalian uh, ancestors or something um, they might start trying to burrow into a hole and get into a fetal position and just try and stay. Uh, it, try and get into that hole and, and uh, things of that nature. So those are sure signs that that person's in, in bad, bad trouble. Um, so we, we need to stop that before it ever gets that bad. Um, if left to progress, uh, that person's eventually going to go unconscious. Um, the vital signs are going to get down to the point where you might, might actually think they're dead. Uh, you may not get a radial pulse down at the wrist. Um, you may need to be checking vital signs at the carotid. Um, and you may need to check that pulse at the carotid for a full minute um, to even get any kind of a pulse out of that. And that's going to kind of be your, uh, your, your thing you're going to be uh, looking to, to run through before you got into anything like uh, rescue breathing or um, CPR. Um, that person's uh, breathing and, and pulse is going to be so low. Um, that's the body just basically trying to protect the, uh, the most important organs and the brain. Uh, just to keep the body alive. Um, so we want to fight that before it ever gets that bad. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that can happen uh, when it's left to progress that far prior to death. If uh, the person's moved too roughly or something like that, uh, the heart can actually go into cardiac arrest, uh, ventricular fibrillation, uh, heart muscle uh, doing no uh, real uh, uh, coordinated effort anymore, and uh, you could actually put the person to cardiac arrest. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind as well. Um, even if it got to the point where they, they were, uh, uh, that it was severe hypothermia and, and you felt they were near dead or were dead, um, the body is really not dead until it's warm and dead. If it's still cold and dead, um, that person's probably still not dead. Um, kids and other folks have bounced back from uh, severely hypothermic situations and, and have uh, uh, been brought back with no, no problems um, with, uh, with regard to brain function or anything like that. Um, uh, full recovery. Um, so again, they're not co they're not dead until they're warm and dead. So how do we fight that uh, that cold challenge? How do we stop this from progressing into a, a severe form of hypothermia? Uh, one way you can do this, and if you're out in the back country and you ha you're uh, you've been out camping, is uh, using things like a hypothermia wrap. And I'm going to have to Lenny get in this in a second here, but I want to talk about a few other things that we can do out there that we have with us. So you may have things like uh, one of these um, space blanket style bivy sacks, this Western Mountaineering hot sack, uh, vapor barrier sack, would work great. I could have her get in there and believe it or not, even if she is hypothermic, her body's going to help regenerate heat um, by using this uh, and reflecting the heat back onto her body and that'll help absolutely. Um, so any of your space blankets or emergency uh, bivy sacks, things of that nature, uh, will certainly help. Um, so that's one option. Uh, another that we go over uh, each year at the Winter Skills event is uh, using things like these emergency uh, hasty shelters like this uh, Bothy bag. Um, they come in different sizes. This one's a rather big one, a four to six person one. I'd get under there with her, wrap her up in as many layers as we could get, and uh, I can help her get uh, warm back underneath this. And if there's any kind of precipitation coming down, absolutely. Uh, this is going to provide great shelter and help regenerating and uh, rewarming her. And the rewarming process, just like with frostbite, has to happen slowly. You can't just rush them straight into a lodge or something like that, even though our instinct would tell us to. Uh, but um, because when her body's gotten that cold, everything's starting to shunt. All the warm blood and everything is going to get shunted back towards the core to protect the vital organs and the brain. Uh, back to that heart muscle and things like that. So everything else is going to be extremely cold, and they can kind of go into it. If you rapidly rewarm rewarm them, uh, they can go into kind of an after drop type situation where, um, if you try and rapidly rewarm those hands and feet and periphery too quickly, it can send all that uh, uh, crystallized blood back towards the uh, uh, you know ice cold blood back towards the core and basically shock that person into an even worse state of hypothermia. So keep that in mind. That's why we, uh, we keep that rewarming process down to a, 
a slow pace, uh, slowly rewarming them. Um, so yes, body bags are great. Um, other things we can think of out there, obviously uh, warm fluids and uh, warm food if that person's still conscious, so certainly break out the stove and get some warm fluids into them. Um, you may also have things like, you know, aside from a emergency blanket, uh, they have these uh, basically uh, uh, another type of emergency blanket with uh, uh, a layer of mylar in between to wrap the person up with. Same concept as a uh, emergency space blanket or the uh, Western Mountaineering hot sack I had out here. Um, there's even things that the military uses like this ready heat and uh, this is basically a six panel uh, chemically heated blanket so basically picture a, a huge hand or foot warmer with men multiple panels of them that you can put this on this person. Uh, obviously you wouldn't put this directly on their skin because they could get a, a chemical heat burn uh, from that uh, so we would put this over a base layer or something like that and wrap the person up in it but it's kind of heavy and kind of unrealistic to carry in a backcountry um, but uh, a similar concept could be things like um, putting these uh, little uh, hand and foot warmers in key locations on that person. So uh, next to the neck, over top of a base layer of some kind, under the armpits, over the thorax, down into the groin, things of that nature. Anything uh, to help rewarm that core in that person and allow that body to start regenerating uh, nice, warm, oxygenated blood back out to the periphery and, uh, and rewarm themselves uh, underneath those layers. So I would include things like this or maybe even uh, uh, hot water bottles, heat up a, a, a Nalgene bottle of water and place that on the person's stomach or upper thorax um, to, uh, to kind of help rewarm that person as well. So um, the next thing I'm going to talk about here is uh, maybe using a hypothermia wrap, if you will. Basically you're turning that person into a big burrito. Um, and all I'm going to do here is I would put extra layers onto Delaney uh, I'd wrap her up in as many things as I could get onto her. Um, and then I'm going to try and get this person into the sleeping bags. If we're out on a backcountry trip, chances are we're both going to have sleeping pads with us. We're both going to have sleeping bags. That's all going to her at this point. All right, I'm going to try and make sure that everything is going to her. Obviously, I need to stay warm as well, but I'm going to be working to, to keep her uh, from progressing into a severe form of hypothermia. So what I'll do is basically I uh, have her climb into the sleeping bag here. <laughs> okay. Oh jeez. Yep. So I'd get that get her down into that bag as best I could. And I'll have her scooch down. Obviously, if, if I have to do all the work and the person's, uh, um, you know, basically um, not able to do it themselves, I'm going to have to figure out a way to scooch them into that uh, that bag as best I can. I'd get this down hood up over her. You want to scooch down a little bit more? Okay. And I'm going to try and get as many layers up around her head and neck as well as, as possible. She's on top of two different sleeping pads. I also have a mountain serape underneath her as well, and then yet another tarp underneath that. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get achieve about three and a half to four inches of, of real insulation all the way around her uh, is what I'm going to try and do. I'm going to get this all pulled up over top of her as well. And if I have to put this up over her face, maybe I'm going to use something like a Sam splint to create a little bit of a hoop here so that I can keep that off of her face so that it doesn't impede her respiration at all. So I'd get her nice and warm in there. And I've got this all wrapped up as best I can right now. Anything that you can provide additional uh, insulation and layering, even uh, you know something like your Crazy Creek chair or something like that. Finally, I'm going to go ahead and start the wrapping process. So I might uh, put in the tails of my tarp a little bit here, the corners. Bring those in.
bring in all my corners. Probably figure out a way to bring this up over the bottom so it doesn't doesn't slide loose. And then I'm gonna just bring the sides in as much as possible. To basically wrap her up like a burrito. And if I need to, I might go so far as to go ahead and get a couple of uh, straps, compression straps off your pack, whatever it might be, um, to create a nice way to uh, lash her into this system. And I'll keep doing this process until I've got her completely wrapped up. And if I need to, I can then try and figure out a way to get her into a sled of some kind and uh, I'd pull her out on a sled on an Accio, something like that and uh, she could be well and truly nice and warm now and I can at least still monitor her as I go maybe uh, while I'm trying to get her out of this uh, cold weather environment back to definitive care I'm pulling her back in the sled and now I can stop her once in a while and say hey are you still with me, right? Yeah. I can check her, I can check her vital signs, I can check her pulse, I can check her respirations, things of that nature, to make sure uh, she's doing okay. I want to keep her among the living as best I can. I don't want to get her, uh, let, let that uh, progress into that severe form. Uh, if she's still conscious, maybe I'm going to give her some sips of some warm fluids and route back to uh, the trailhead and, and back into the vehicle if I can. So that kind of covers the hypothermia wrap piece. The key being, we never want to let it get this bad. We never want to let it get to the point where we have to do all this to save that person. So look for those warning signs ahead of time. The umbles, uh, that incoherent uh, activity, maybe that paradoxical behavior. Um, maybe they're making those uh, stumbles on the trails, things of that nature. Hey, look, we're going to keep we're going to keep a, a track of that stuff and. Uh, Look for that in ourselves and in our partners out there and combat that uh, cold challenge early on before you ever have to get to this point. Uh, obviously, uh, if she's in, in this bad off, I got to get her to a hospital quick and uh, we, we have to do a lot of work now to, to make sure she's, uh, she's brought back uh, to full function. So um, with that said, uh, that kind of covers the, the hypothermia piece. So the final thing that uh, I'm going to discuss with you here today is uh, uh, acute mountain sickness, uh, AMS. Uh, comes in a few different forms. Um, most often, uh, it's just going to be a mild uh, to moderate form, uh, acute mountain sickness of uh, uh, you know ascending too fast, not being acclimatized, maybe not even hydrated uh, well enough. Um, maybe our fitness level isn't uh, quite there to help us uh, uh, get to the top of that mountain um, without undue exertion and uh, we push ourselves too hard we're not acclimatized come straight from sea level straight up to 10 or 12,000 feet and uh, now uh, we start feeling that uh, maybe uh, worst hangover you ever had in your life a, a very uh, severe headache um, maybe we're uh, um, you know feeling a little dizzy a little nauseous even um, we go to sleep that night, still got that headache, and uh, maybe not sleeping as well, um, having uh, kind of sleep disturbances, and maybe your partner noticed that uh, you started having uh, long pauses uh, in between breaths, chain stokes, uh, respirations, and uh, sleep apnea. Um, you wake up the next day with that uh, uh, headache that just never seems to go away. Maybe the aspirin didn't help. The, the fluids, um, things of that nature. Maybe you took in too much caffeine or nicotine, things of that nature. Uh, maybe you got into some uh, some whiskey or something, thinking that was going to help you stay warm. And of course, not only did that not contribute to helping you acclimatize, but you also probably set yourself for, up for uh, hypothermia, which we just discussed. Um, so, guess what? Um, you're feeling all those kinds of symptoms and uh, uh, looking looking like uh, uh, you're not uh, on on top of your game. You've got acute mountain sickness. Uh, there's some golden rules with uh, with uh, acute mountain sickness, uh, AMS, um, and uh, the golden rules are: if you feel unwell, um, you have AMS until proven otherwise. Um, the next one being: um, 
don't continue ascending uh, with symptoms. Um, stop right there. Don't try and push through it. Your body's not going to get better the higher you go. It's going to get worse. And finally, um, if you are getting worse, um, you stayed at that same altitude and uh, didn't ascend any higher, but you're just, you just keep getting worse, descend. That's really the only true definitive care for any uh, uh, of these uh, uh, altitude-related illnesses um, is, uh, is to descend. That's the only true thing you can do in the field to uh, help yourself out with that. Now, that acute mountain sickness, um, sometimes if it's in, in a, a mild to moderate form, um, that headache and uh, uh, breathlessness and things of that nature and, and um, uh, not sleeping well, if you stay uh, at that same altitude or maybe even go a little lower uh, for a day or two, um, you'll, you'll generally start getting a little better and you'll, you'll uh, acclimatize to that altitude a little bit better. And the body has an amazing way of doing that. However, um, we don't put all our eggs in that basket. Uh, we're going to keep it a, a watchful eye on, on that level. Um, and uh, maybe we can get away with it. Maybe we acclimatize and do a little better. And uh, don't let me scare you too much. I mean, uh, you know, if, if uh, you can start feeling the effects of, uh, of the altitude as low as 8,000 feet. And AMS can show up at, at that level as well. However, um, oftentimes with a day or two uh, at that level um, and, uh, and not... Uh, exerting ourselves too heavily, uh, keeping, keeping it kind of nice and moderate and easy, um, your body will, will adapt to that uh, pretty decently. But uh, to really acclimatize to higher altitudes, uh, 12, 13, 14, 15,000 feet or higher, um, your body really needs a, about a week to, to acclimatize to, say, around 16 grand. It needs a full week uh, to acclimatize to that level. Um, you really don't get fully acclimatized to running around in the mountains until after uh, a couple of weeks uh, living in those conditions and at that elevation. So keep that in mind. Uh, so remember those golden rules. Um, if you feel unwell you and you're at altitude, you have AMS until proven otherwise. Um, if you uh, are feeling symptoms, you do not ascend any further. Um, and then finally, um, if you're getting worse, descend, descend, descend. Um, some of the more uh, severe forms that you might see out there, uh, particularly out there in the Colorado Rockies or anywhere in the world where you might be going up to uh, very high elevations, um, is uh, the first of which is uh, HAEP, uh, high altitude pulmonary edema. Um, this is basically fluid on the lungs. Um, it's normally a natural response. If, you, if the best way to explain it is if uh, um, sitting in your home and you accidentally uh, inhaled a, a particle, a food particle or something like that, accidentally into your lungs. And uh, your natural response from your lungs would be to uh, shut down that part of your lung uh, to protect that uh, and until you could expel that from your body. Well, what comes with that is fluids that uh, shut down that part of that lung. Um, at altitude, that same natural response, uh, because there's less oxygen to breathe up there, uh, starts uh, permeating throughout your entire lungs, you basically get wet lungs. Um, and so this coupled with that headache that you're already feeling from being at altitude, breathlessness, and you're not able to catch your breath uh, very well because there's less O2, uh, and now you start ending up with, uh, with this going on in your lungs. Um, now we've got uh, probably a productive cough going on, uh, frothy or, or pinkish tinged uh, sputum uh, when you cough. Um, bad, bad signs, it's time to go down. Um, and uh, there's really no other way to fix that up there that high. Now there are some meds that you can use at, at higher altitudes. Um, one being uh, Diamox, uh, acetazolamide. It is a medicine, uh, a, a drug that um, is proven to help you acclimatize faster and it can be used in the treatment of, of HAPE, uh, high altitude pulmonary edema. Um, however, um, it's always better to acclimatize uh, first instead of taking meds. Uh, things like that or dexamethasone, a steroid, uh, nifedipine, and even Viagra uh, have been shown to uh, as, as proven uh, ways to help you uh, acclimatize uh, meds that can be used uh, uh, against HAPE and HAZE, uh, which we'll talk about in a few seconds here. Um, so um, the better way to do it is, is to do proper acclimatization. Uh, there's an old saying in the mountaineering world, climb high, sleep low. And uh, what that means is uh, 
ascending, you, you get to that uh, certain elevation ascending one to 2,000 feet per day and then descending back down to a lower, lower elevation, uh, back down 1,000 feet or so um, to, uh, to get that night of sleep, spend a night at that level, and then go up another 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet, descend again uh, to a, a lower level to sleep. Um, these kinds of things will help your body adapt to those higher elevations faster um, and better. Fitness level is not a, a, an, a, in, a, a way to, uh, um, if you're highly fit, doesn't mean you're not going to get AMS or HAPE or HACE. You're, you can get it anyways. Um, sometimes heredity is involved. Um, some people just do better at it than others uh, at, at altitude. Um, older folks uh, tend to be a little better, um, and so do women oftentimes. They oftentimes do not um, uh, push as hard or as fast. Uh, um, and uh, so their exertion level stays a little lower and they uh, do a little better and uh, acclimatize a little easier that way without sustaining uh, AMS. So if we've got those, uh, those wet lungs going on um, and uh, you're, you're, you've got that uh, frothy uh, blood tinge sputum or anything like that, um, yeah, time to descend, time to get off the mountain. That mountain's not going anywhere. Uh, you can always come back another day maybe when you're a little bit better acclimatized and a little bit better prepared for that environment. Um, so uh, keep that in mind with, with hate. Uh, true definitive uh, care is to, to descend, and you're probably going to the hospital at that point anyways uh, to get on some kind of meds to, uh, to help get that, uh, that junk out of, your, uh, out of your chest, out of your lungs. Um, you could set on things like pneumonia and things of that nature as well. Once you've gotten uh, a, a high-altitude illness, um, you're predisposed to getting one again as well, so keep that in mind. Um, the other one that can sometimes happen along with HAPE is HACE, uh, high altitude cerebral edema. Um, this is fluid on the brain. They're still not quite sure exactly why this happens at altitude, uh, but the bottom line there is, is this is another one that can and will kill you if you let it progress worse. Um, obviously, uh, fluid on the brain, it's also going to impair your 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 brain function. It's going to impair your, your level of consciousness. It's going to impair your ability to make good decisions on probably high angle um, exposed terrain, um, which is definitely not the place to be uh, making those kind of mistakes. Um, so once again, the only true definitive care uh, for that is to descend. Uh, if you can get to a lower elevation and uh, um, you know we're not doing a Himalaya mountaineering out there, so things like a, a Gamoff bag or something like that or having uh, oxygen available to you um, at a base camp or something is probably not, uh, not going to be the case. Uh, so your only good thing you can do is get down lower, get to a hospital, and they're probably going to get you on some kind of meds to uh, uh, some kind of diuretic or something to get those fluids out of your, uh, your, your body, uh, those excess fluids, and help you uh, uh, get better again. That being said, um, just through the simple process of descending lower down off that mountain, believe it or not, even with the uh, mild to moderate uh, AMS, the lower you go, the better you're going to feel. Um, you'll, you'll notice that uh, almost really uh, right away. Uh, you drop a thousand feet or more and uh, you're, you're, you suddenly start feeling a lot better. Headache goes away, your breath comes back to you, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so those, those are the big warning signs with uh, with uh, acute mountain sickness there is that altered level of consciousness. We start looking for that, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, frothy sputum, uh, things of that nature, breathlessness, that severe headache that just doesn't seem to keep, uh, get any better uh, no matter what you do, no matter how many fluids you, uh, you put into your body, uh, things of that nature, it just keeps getting worse. Um, and that means descend, descend, descend. Um, one thing that... Uh, is uh, kind of a nice thing that, that, and we'll probably have some of these out there at the uh, the winter skills event just for folks to check out. Is uh, this little uh, uh, AMS worksheet? Uh, it's based on the Lake Louise uh, Acute Mountain Sickness Questionnaire, and it basically has a whole process, a whole laundry list of, of uh, questions you ask yourself or your partner, and assign different uh, different scores uh, to it. Um, One other thing I'll, I'll bring up too, as well, is. Uh, uh, a great all-encompassing uh, backcountry uh, uh, handbook out there is this little field guide to wilderness and rescue medicine. Um, it covers pretty much everything I've discussed in this video. Um, slightly different than how I've done it, uh, but um, generally the same principles, the same signs, symptoms, ways to prevent, ways to treat, uh, all in there in this uh, field guide to wilderness and rescue medicine. Um, 
handy little tool to have in your backcountry first aid kit with you out there so that you can kind of look over these things and watch over yourselves and your partners uh, out there in the backcountry. Um, there's a few other uh, different types of uh, illnesses and injuries that you might sustain out in the, in the backcountry in a winter environment. Um, maybe a little less uh, uh, prevalent nowadays with the advent of uh, you know, all of our modern fabrics and modern uh, 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 you know, insulations and, and things of that nature. Um, and the tools that we have available to us that maybe folks didn't have as often uh, back in the day. And that's going to be things like uh, snow blindness and trench foot. Uh, so obviously snow blindness, if, if, we, if we're out in that heavily snowed or, uh, you know, maybe out on a glacier or heavily snowed environment um, and we lose our, our sunglasses, um, you can set yourself up for snow blindness and it's going to feel awfully bad. I know that uh, those that I, I, I've run into before that have, ha have been snow blind have said it, feels like sand in their eyes um, and they can't open them they can't see well um, but uh, hey we've got sunglasses now nowadays we've got glacier glasses we've got all these different ter options available to us for use out in that backcountry winter environment by all means take advantage of those and take good care of where you're keeping your sunglasses out there maybe you have that backup with you because you know there's the old saying two equals one one equals none with regard to uh, taking care of our eyes and our appendages and stuff like that um, the other one being a trench foot, um, you know, if you're, if you're changing your socks, taking care of your feet, um, and, you know, and, and you're, this oftentimes can happen if you're wearing one of those vapor barrier uh, boots, uh, the old Mickey Mouse boots, or, or potentially a, a vapor barrier sock, and now your feet get uh, clammy and wet inside those, uh, those boots or socks. Um, if you're changing your socks often, and, and every day at least, and keeping those nice dry layers on your feet, uh, by all means, uh, you, chances of you getting a trench foot aren't, aren't that great. Um, but it still can happen, uh, so keep that in mind as well. If you're out there trying to enjoy that backcountry environment, um, take care of those feet. Uh, don't cheat your feet, it's an old saying. Um, and then a couple other things that uh, can happen at, at higher altitudes and, um, you know, sort of uh, altitude-related. Uh, one is... Uh, uh, you know, and, and I've seen this before when I lived in Colorado years past, uh, high altitude retinal hemorrhage. Uh, folks uh, going straight up into the 14ers and things like that, um, you know, they get a, a little hemorrhage in, in, the, uh, in their, the uh, vessels of their eyes, uh, of their retina. And, uh, you know, it looks horrible, but it's usually self-limiting. Uh, it's not necessarily an indicator that you're going to end up with hay for haze as well. But um, if you've ascended that quickly, and uh, that uh, you end up with one of these spontaneous retinal hemorrhages, um, you know, guess what? You probably were going a little too fast up into those mountains and uh, trying to push it. Uh, so um, maybe it is time to slow it down a little bit and get back down to a lower elevation and acclimatize better before you, you go up high again. Um, and then one other final thing, this usually happens with very, very thin uh, females at altitude. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but um, it has happened. Uh, at elevations as low as 8,000 feet is a spontaneous pneumothorax, so basically uh, um, you know, popping a hole through your, uh, through your chest wall um, and causing a partial collapse of your, uh, one of your lungs. Um, again, this is not something that happens often. It can happen. It's something to be aware of. Uh, the bigger things, obviously, with altitude illnesses is going to be uh, to worry about your standard uh, uh, mild and moderate forms of acute mountain sickness and then potentially uh, if you're really high up, uh, having a hay or haste show up um, uh, that can happen is, you know, from 10 grand on, really. Uh, so proper acclimatization, uh, monitoring your exertion levels and, and things of that nature and uh, keeping a watchful eye for each other. Uh, taking your time getting to the top of that mountain and uh, um, will we'll usually help you out a great deal with warding off from getting any one of these things, aside from the altitude illnesses, uh, all the way back through your your, uh, your cold weather injuries and illnesses. If you take your time a little bit and uh, approach it with some intelligence, uh, you're much less likely to, uh, to end up with any of these, these things. Uh, you know, getting to the top of that mountain's optional, getting back down is mandatory. So uh, good luck to you all out there, and hopefully I'll see you uh, out west this winter. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, the things I, I discussed here in this video will, uh, will help you out. So take care. Bye. <laughs>